Sam, an alcoholic. I also smoked a lot of non-habit forming marijuana that I was addicted to. The committee has given me a list of 23 words I can't use. Would you like to hear them? Good. Let's start off by making them nervous. I think I've been like that all my life, just running around stirring it up as much as I could. Well, I was a reluctant birth. I did not want to be born. I mean, if I had a light and something to read, I'd be in there yet. I <laughs> did not care to come out. The only reason I did is because I gave the doctor the finger and he pulled me out. <laughs> then 20 minutes after I was born, I was longing for the good old days. I <laughs> I've never wanted to be where I was at until after I'd been here a while, although I, good readers here tonight. Uh, when I was very new, I went to a meeting, and there was a lady got up here to read, and she got a death grip on this lectern. And she said, good evening, I'm a happy, grateful alcoholic. And I thought, oh, I bet she is. Some guy in the front row was drunk, and he said, somebody ought to inform your face, lady. And so I felt at home. She got to the 12 steps, and they sounded like the 12 threats. <laughs> she was done with them. I come from a family of alcoholics, and not all of them drink, but I wish they would. <laughs> Easier to control. <laughs> I learned a lot of uh, really rotten and terrible things when I was a child. I had an Aunt Bessie who only had two bedtime stories, and she'd get drunk and very maudlin, and she would say to my sister and me, do you want to hear about the time your Uncle Louie was a bootlegger or when I was a whore in Peoria? <laughs> so. So I learned the facts of life early on, but I didn't know that's what they were. I just heard a lot of strange things and tried to put it into action and got into trouble. My Aunt Bessie taught me wonderful words to say also. I, so I got into trouble early on there, too. She would give me a quarter if I would say fuck in the grocery store and embarrass my mother. And I got a dollar if I said it in church. So, how I earned my first money. Now, my mother had a cure for all this. She sentenced me to eight years in a Catholic school where I majored in guilt, which was their big thing. <laughs> I taught the nuns a lot of new words, and they taught me a few things, mostly about staying every night after school. It took me two and a half years to learn to say, yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. I am a very stubborn individual. And so I kept right on going, staying every night after school for two and a half years until I finally said, yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. And I became an altar boy, and I sang in the choir and got straight A's from then on to keep them off my back and not for any other reason. And I stayed in the family business, which was stealing. <laughs> and... The nuns saved me from jail, but after I got out of the Catholic school, I went straight to the Reform School, where they'd been waiting for me, but the discipline was about the same. I didn't mind it too much, and the food was better than home, so it was a step up, perhaps. But I, uh, I went through puberty while I was in Reform School, and about 20 minutes, that's all it took. I didn't waste any time, and I got out of there, and I was a rotten little obnoxious kid loose on the street. And I got into a lot of trouble right away. And uh, I had no idea what I was doing. I just kept running out and bumping into people, it seemed like, always in some crummy situation. I was married when I was 16, and I was a father before I was 17, and I'm trying to figure out how all this happened. What's going on here? When I was 18 years old, I was arrested for nine felonies, and I was guilty of every one of them. They threw me threw me in the county jail where my Uncle Bill was already in there doing 90 days for drunk and disorderly. My Aunt Gussie was in the women's jail next door for knifing my Uncle Louie. 
Then they throw me in there. My father came to see us on the first visiting day, and he's drunk, and they arrested him in the visiting room. So <laughs> it was family reunion every time I went to jail. I, I had no fear of jail. So. I got put away, and the sweet young thing that I was married to had sense enough to divorce me and marry a nice guy and move to Pittsburgh, and I ain't seen her since. I got out of the penitentiary, and I started to, uh, this thing's about as steady as my program, it keeps moving here. <laughs> Try to leave you with some hope tonight. I'm... <laughs> I've been sober a long time, but on some days I don't look too good. <laughs> anyway, I started to drink as soon as I got out of the penitentiary, and I also started using a lot of drugs. I didn't mind what I took. I don't identify with people who specialize. I drank anything that had alcohol in it that was too thin to chew, and I took a lot of pills and smoked marijuana. I didn't care. It was all right with me. I mean, it's a lot reality out because that's what I hated and that's what I detested and I did not know what to do about it except drink and use drugs and that's what I did. When I was 23, 24 years old I ran into a mathematical genius and he figured out how to fill out income tax forms and get money back and I had not worked where he said I worked but we got the check and we cashed it, split it and then we did it again the next year. Two weeks after that check arrived the police arrived. I'm in trouble again and I'm still on parole from the other damn mess. But I had used my father's name, so they arrested him for it. <laughs> and well, my father was drunk all the time. He thought he had done it, so it wasn't <laughs> no big deal. He went into court and pled guilty, and they uh, put him in the federal pen right up the road here, and by that time, Alcoholics Anonymous had come to the jail, and uh, the old bastard sobered up. <laughs> However, he never knew that I 12-stepped him. <laughs> I, I tried to tell him one time. I, I was two and a half years sober, and I went to see him. It's time to make the amends. I held off as long as I could, and I thought, I really better make this amend, and I was leery of it because... I thought at first, this is really something. Father and son, both sober members of Alcoholics Anonymous, going to a meeting together. He stopped on the way out the door, opened the drawer of his desk there and pulled out a gun, stuck it down in his belt, and I said, what the hell kind of meeting are we going to? You afraid somebody's going to steal your big book? And <laughs> he hauled off and slugged me, and I landed right on the floor, and all I could think of while I was on that floor was, i got to make this amend. Now what? But the step says, except when to do so would injure them or others. And I immediately became others. So. I hung out in that little town that I was born and raised in until I was off of parole. And one day after I was off parole, I'm out of there. I found a place over here in Kentucky where they sold marijuana and booze in the same building. I had found it, what I was looking for, and I hung out with a lot of Italians that I thought were gangsters, and they weren't. They were just Italians. I, I didn't know that. They're my heroes. So uh, I hung out in some pretty low-life bars, too, and I was a witness to a killing one night, and I knew what to do if you're a witness to anything. When in doubt, get out of there and change your name. Well, I, I went home to Mama, reeled in my umbilical cord, Mama had been to Al-Anon. Yep. She had those little beady eyes and that smile. She got me up against the wall and released me. <laughs> Said, you can stay here for a couple of days and you get your ass out of here because you're going to stay loaded. And I thought, what? Who, me? Mr. Nice Guy? While I was there, the, my youngest brother came around running from the police and other people. And one morning, as he and I were puking together, he says to me, if our luck holds out, we'll be dead by noon. <laughs> How bad it was. Then we got a little booze to stay down, and pretty soon he's saying, as soon as we get off of this one, let's really go on one. 
And that's all it ever took for me was to get some of that stuff to stay down, and then, by God, I was out and running again. And a few days later, he and I came to in the back seat of a wrecked car in a junkyard full of wrecked cars. And if you're paranoid, that'll do something to you. <laughs> it's early in the morning. There's fog all over the place, and he's waking me up, and he said, Wake up. I think we've been thrown away. <laughs> and It was more than I could handle. I got out of there. I moved to Venice, California, where I was to live for the next 32 years of my life. I knew enough to start at the bottom because that's where I usually was anyway. So I walked into a bar in Venice and said, where's the worst place in town to live in? The guy said, right over there. He said, I don't even go in that place in the daytime. I went, okay. So I moved in. I fell in love with the girl next door. She was a schizophrenic, suicidal, manic depressive. <laughs> Hated life as much as I did. She would come home every night from work and she'd brush her teeth, turn on the gas and go to bed. <laughs> and So it was natural for us to fall in love. She kept telling me how she was schizophrenic, and I said, don't worry about it, I'll have sex with both of you. So, I lived there for two years. And after the end of the second year, I called my father at Christmas time, which was the only time he would accept a collect call from me. He said, well, what did you get for Christmas? Knowing I didn't get anything, I didn't, wasn't quite sure it was Christmas, except I had it marked because that's the day I could call him, or at least the day before. He suggested that I go to Alcoholics Anonymous, and for some reason or other, I paid attention to him. I have no idea why. I said, okay, I'll, I'll go over there and try it. And he said, now, don't go over there loaded. I want you to quit taking everything and don't smoke any marijuana before you go over there because you won't hear anything. And I didn't realize that marijuana affected my hearing that much. <laughs> but I quit everything. It took me two days, and I started out to find AA in Los Angeles. There wasn't any in Venice at the time. And I got on a bus and went into town. And I'm by this time, two days off of everything. It's the first time in my life since I'd started using that I'd ever been off of anything. And it, it, frightened me. I didn't know what the hell to do. I'm wandering around town trying to find a meeting, just crazy and alone. I finally found a meeting that night. In those days in Los Angeles, most meetings ran from 8.30 to 10 o'clock. I walked into the meeting at 10 minutes of 10. There was a woman sharing, and she said that she wet her pants twice and came to AA. I thought, well, wait till they find out what I've done. I never even thought anything about it. The kind of bars I drank in, I don't think they even noticed. I didn't mention marijuana, they didn't. I didn't mention drugs, they didn't mention it. I thought, okay, I have a slight problem with the bottle, that's all I copped to. And I stayed clean and sober for 10 days, and I went to a meeting every night. And since I hadn't heard about certain things, I smoked a joint. And then I smoked another one. And then I got thirsty and I drank. And then I got drowsy, so I took some amphetamines. <laughs> Come out of that. See, I used to bullshit myself that the amphetamines enhanced my intelligence. Yeah, and all they did was speed up my mouth. <laughs> so I had a combination of an amphetamine mouth, a Demerol brain, and <laughs> got me into a lot of trouble. So, uh, that slip lasted um, about a week, and I had heard about lower companions, and I thought, by God, that's what I am. I haven't gone to a lower companion meeting, and I'm going to quit again and go back and find... Alcoholics Anonymous and lower companion meetings, and by golly, that's what I did. And I uh, walked into a club where I'd gone to meetings, and I said, where the hell's a lower companion meeting? He said, right over here at the corner of Pico and Alvarado in Los Angeles, and the group's name was the end of the line. And that sucker was the end of the line. Man, something else. I started the meeting, and the guy pounds the gavel down, and uh, he said, we don't read here. He said, there's no traditions here. It's every man for himself. And I thought, well... Pretty liberal group. 
A few minutes into the meeting, uh, through the side door came three dykes. That's three lesbians. Uh, well, sometimes you have to translate in Indiana. <laughs> Anyways, as they came through the door, the two uh, sober ones are holding up the drunken one, and uh, she kind of fell, and she dropped her purse, and out fell a gun, a bottle, and a dildo. And <laughs> the two sober ones got to fighting over the contents of the purse, and the, the chairman kicked them out. They let her stay, and they never came back for her, so we had to take her home, but she sobered up, and she said that she was sober because she was made welcome at that group. Yeah, and I firmly believe that should say it for Alcoholics Anonymous, for anybody that comes in here. I don't care how different you are, or if you're schizophrenic, bring yourselves in. You know, the whole work is welcome. <laughs> Another life-saving thing that happened at that meeting was they asked for announcements, and a guy stood up and he said, I'm sinking into a depression. I'm going to kill myself this week, and I want to say goodbye to all my friends. <laughs> Damn, I was beginning to identify with people even though they were leaving. And the chairman said to him, go ahead and do it, you son of a bitch. Nobody likes you anyway. I thought, wow. So I'd found a home. And I'd also found a sponsor. There was a guy there that I used to drink with, and I thought, hey, all right, somebody that knows me. But, but he had a program that was a little too liberal for me. A couple of weeks into my sobriety, George and I were on our way to the end of the line meeting. We stopped to get something to eat, and George ordered a ham sandwich and a bottle of beer. And I said, George, I think beer is a no-no. And he said to me, beer is a beverage, punk. <laughs> okay. So I took my sandwich and left, and within a matter of months, George had yet another drunk driving charge to add to his list. He ended up being shot and killed by a bus driver in Santa Monica, California. And bus drivers usually just call the cops or kick your ass off the bus. This one shot George through the heart. And so much for beer as a beverage, punk. <laughs> I met a man at, at the same meeting, and I liked what he said one evening. He said, I'm sober today and I'm not unhappy about it. And that was the problem. I knew I didn't like sobriety particularly. And if I'm going to have to go through this the rest of my life, this guy said he wasn't unhappy about it. So I followed him around and I asked him to be my sponsor. What I didn't know was that he had bullshit filters in his ears. <laughs> so he could translate all the wonderful things that I had to say. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> And he saved my life, consequently, by telling me the truth. And I'd ask him about the, the things we had up on the wall, about live and let live and all that sort of thing. And he'd say, well, in your case, live and let live means mind your own goddamn business. I thought, well, I can understand that. I said, what about think, think, think? He said, in your case, it's with what, 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 so forget it. <laughs> you haven't been sober enough for that. I said, well, what about some of the others? And he said, well, the other one is let go and be dragged. Or be dragged. I thought, well, I better let go here. Sometimes after I'd been sober a while, I'd argue with him, and I'd say, you old wet-brained bastard, just shut up and let me alone. And he'd say to me, did you hear that noise? I'd say, what noise? He'd say, I heard your mind close. <laughs> So I went to the Venice meeting every Monday night, and I went to the end of the line meeting every Sunday night, and I went to a lot of other meetings. And I began to work the steps because I was afraid not to. And I worked them again that first year because by that time, I wanted to. And it was only possible because I stayed sober long enough to find a want here. And that's why I continue to be an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous now. Uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, I'll be sober 44 years. Well, that's a long time. Uh, I 
that's a long time in the life of any human being, but a long time, it can be an eternity for an alcoholic if you don't find something here. So, and if you don't find it, don't think there's something wrong with your program. See, I, I went through a period of time where I thought I had a spiritual awakening and a spiritual experience, and I really began to carry the message to people that didn't want it. <laughs> Never left home without the big book. <laughs> And after a while, it really got bad. I began to carry a Bible under one arm and a big book under the other arm, and that'll empty the hall, and did. My sponsor and a guy that ran a, an AA club in Los Angeles decided to do something with me, and so they used to send me out on fake 12-step calls to get rid of me. <laughs> and being an AA fanatic, I brought people back. They hadn't called, but if Alkies are reluctant, offer them a bottle. That's what I did. I bribed them, got them to meetings, and some of those people sobered up, and they're still sober today, and they don't know they're in AA by mistake. <laughs> you can't tell somebody with that much sobriety to get the hell out. Here's your misery back. Uh, <laughs> never made the call. It also proved to me that it's not the individual. It's the group that does it. See, something happens here, because if any group had a, or I mean, if any single individual had a hold of it, I mean... There's enough of those around anyway. Some cults in California are incredible, man. They're huge. They, uh, man, they, the whole group walks on the water, I think. Uh, well, I'm with old Doc Smith, one of the co-founders, and he said we hold to no glorification of the individual. And I was so spiritual at one time, I could knock an Al-Anon down at 20 feet. <laughs> that, I shook hands with a newcomer, their whole right side sobered up. <laughs> Again, my sponsor to the rescue, he said, if you get any closer to God, you're going to rip them off. And I said, what? You want to hear that? Again, he told me the truth. And so I've watched cult things go on around here, and some people are gurus and like that, especially on the West Coast. Man, have they got them out there. One of them's even written a book. It's, um, oh, what is it? As, as Clancy sees what Bill thought he saw. <laughs> Nobody's ahead of anybody else around here. Some of us have been here longer, and that's all that means. <laughs> I got here when I was young, and that's how I got to be old simple as that, because I have stayed an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I do not care to rule and govern and whatever. There was a time in my life when I did, hell yes. And it was a disaster, of course. Then I sank into a depression some years back, and I didn't want anybody to think there was something wrong with my program, so I just stood around and posed as a human being. Oh, yeah, I never felt better. It's just wonderful. On and on. I was dying inside and not doing anything about it. And I certainly wasn't telling anybody about it. And finally, I had to tell somebody about it before I went crazy or did God knows what else. I was, I was crazy enough. I came home from a meeting one evening and left my car running in the garage, determined to kill myself. And I went in the house and did the dishes and left three suicide notes. It's going to be neat. And went back out and laid down in the back seat of the car and discovered I had to go to the bathroom. So I got up. It's Again, going to be clean. Went inside, and while I'm in the house, the phone rings. I am nosy on my deathbed. So I answered the phone, and it was a newcomer in a depression. So <laughs> what am I going to tell him? <laughs> <laughs> you interrupted my half-assed suicide attempt. <laughs> no, I didn't tell him that. <laughs> Naturally, I had to tell him how good I felt. <laughs> that was the last time I lied about that. 
and I don't ever want to put myself in that position again, and I'm the one that did it, it wasn't anybody else. I take the responsibility for my own actions. I don't like to do that on some days, but I don't know of any other way to go that works worth a damn. Now, one of the ways I survived my childhood was detachment. I watched my relatives and I was not a part of them, nor did I ever care to be, because they have no, they don't know I exist. I go to the family reunions and it's still the same thing. Now, I'm 73 years old and my Uncle Frank still asks me when I got out of the Army. I have never been in the Army, for one thing. <laughs> then he'll say, how long have you been wearing glasses? Since I was nine years old, Uncle Frank. I really don't need to be around people like that. Around here, you know, somebody says, how are you? I say, <laughs> oh. They understand. <laughs> Feel the same way. Now, there's been some unsolvable questions in my life, and I don't fight them anymore. I've uh, surrendered to all this. I once heard a guy say, it's been a rough day because I'm between surrender. Yeah. <laughs> I identify with that because I am one stubborn individual. I will hold on forever right to my deathbed. I've certainly discovered that I can do that. And so today I surrender on a regular basis. I have people in my life that I can talk to. I take inventories and I still read them to somebody else. And I try to find somebody that's fairly new. I, by that I mean five to ten years, has worked the steps, understands or has somewhat of an understanding of the program, and that uh, certainly has enough. They will listen to me, in other words. And they've saved my life many times. And that's who I go to to listen to. I, I listen to everybody. You never know what you're going to hear at a meeting that might save your life. And I don't care how bad they read chapter five or whatever you read here, because I've been to some meetings that um, I went to a, well, this is a long time ago, so it must have been a Valium group, or perhaps early Xanax group, maybe that's it. Uh, in a treatment center, and they got some dude up here to read chapter five, and it took him 24 minutes to do it. He was just so damn slow, and he got to the part in chapter five where it says we are not saints, so he read it, we are now saints. <laughs> he stopped and looked around and said, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Where do you get out of here, Fred? <laughs> I've had some wild and wonderful 12-step calls. I've had some wonderful encounters with all kinds of people where some of them are still in my life today, and I like the continuity of all that. I've had some that didn't necessarily go my way. There was a little gay dude that used to hang around the Venice meeting and, and uh, I r ride motorcycles and have most of my life and he kept saying to me I, come on I, I want to ride on your motorcycle I said Alexis get away from me just leave me alone I, I mean go talk to your sponsor or something and finally I'd had enough I said get on I took him up on the freeway I went 110 miles an hour I thought that'll fix this little bastard and we got back to the club, and I said, well, what did you think of that? He said, I've always wanted to be a motorcycle bitch. I'm yours. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen when <laughs> you go to a meeting. <laughs> I've had a lot of medical problems in the last several years, and every time I see a doctor, I just lay down and say, take what you want. <laughs> there ain't much left, so hurry. I decided I might as well uh, take it as lightly as I possibly could. And I laugh a lot of times at meetings about a lot of different things, and I take the program seriously, but not somber and deadly. And so that's what I decided to do with this disease that I have, because, I mean, they were taking part. Incredible for a while. A lot of operations, nine in, in three years. And I've had two since May. Uh, and I, the doctor was um, doing the probe thing. <laughs> and he's looking at the screen. And <laughs> I'm in this awful position. And <laughs> he's saying, oh, it's just beautiful up there. It's just beautiful. And, and I thought, 
I looked at him and didn't know what to say. <laughs> but what came over me was I thought, my God, at my age to find out the most beautiful part of my body is 14 inches up my ass. Uh, Be prepared for a few shocks in life as you <laughs> get older. I was at his office a few weeks ago, and before he could get into the room, I grabbed one of the rubber gloves and put it on my hand. I said, okay, Norman, your turn. <laughs> you seen these T-shirts that got the, the thing across that says bum equipment? Right away in my mind, I thought, oh, yeah. And I got one of them, and I put a big arrow on them, the damn thing like this. <laughs> And I walk into his office, and <laughs> I said, this, this place and the grocery store are the only two places I wear that, Norman. He says, I don't want to know about the grocery store. I don't want to hear about it. Don't tell me anything else. <laughs> but if I hadn't joked about it, I'm not sure what kind of a depression I could get in. I can get into a depression over anything. I mean, if my parakeet's constipated, I, oh, well, I have to do something. Uh, yeah. come here on a regular basis because I don't want my spiritual rebirth to become a miscarriage. So, life can be a hell of a thing if you experience it, and by golly, I'm not one of those dudes with binoculars watching everybody else do the things that I've always wanted to do. I get out and do them. I experience life, and some days I don't like it. But other days, man, what a blast it is. Especially uh, lately, there's been two or three newcomers around my neck of the woods that have just literally saved my life. And they, they don't know that, and they don't even need to know it until years later when they can handle it. But <laughs> some of the things they say, I just watch them. And my God, what an experience that is. Our book says this is an experience you must not miss. And, and hell, I don't want to miss it. I want to be right in the big middle of it. Because that's, uh, see, I'm enabled to do that because I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and then I'm enabled to be a human being after that. And uh, I have a hell of, uh, well, I've got two really good jobs and, and I love to go to those things and I enjoy myself and I just don't take my job serious at all. I'm, I'm a, a disc jockey, I'm on the air a lot and uh, I cussed on the air the other day and I thought, well, I don't give a damn, <laughs> so no big deal. Uh, I just refuse to get caught up in that crap that I used to. I can't live on eggshells because that's what I had to do when I was a child. I couldn't stand being around my father. We never knew what he was going to do. And my father was put in the penitentiary once for child beating, let alone the rest of the crap that he did. And it, I'm, uh, you know, the end result of uh, being beaten a lot, emotionally and physically, when I was a child. And you're scarred immediately with that. And it's a hell of a thing to come out of it. But by God, you can. I'd rather at least make the effort than not make the effort and just give up. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. And I told so many half-truths about all that crap anyway. And not, it didn't matter if I was the worst that ever was, because I've had a couple of psychiatrists tell me that, and I loved it. And then I met an honest one, a woman, and she said, uh, the others had told me how strong I was. And I loved that. I, man, I posed. The lady told me, you're not strong, you're stubborn. Oh, the truth, again. Thought she was related to my sponsor for a while. I used to cut through all that crap that I used to spread. Those of us that are in this room are the luckiest people in the world, or in any room with Alcoholics Anonymous and or Narcotics Anonymous, or wherever you have to go or want to go. And I'm a firm believer, if you need it, then go over there. Whatever will get you through the night if it isn't mind-bending. And that's what I go by today. I surrender to this power, whatever the hell it is. I believe in the power that created the universe, and that's about it. I don't make a big deal out of it. I, my sponsor already told me, if you get any closer to him, you're going to rip him off. So cut that out. Besides, when I was very new, there was a woman that I really hated and detested, and he said, you're going to have to pray for her. And I said, no, I'm not. Come on, you've got to pray for this woman. Well, I prayed for her, and three days later, she died. So... He said, we've got to talk about this prayer thing here. <laughs> and then I had to admit that on the way home from the meeting, I'd bought a doll and two packages of pins.
Come on in here and use this thing, otherwise it's a bunch of talk. And we're very good at that. Most of us are very glib. You don't have to be sober very long. <laughs> you can uh, be a star and Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't want to get ahead of anybody else because I don't want to lose the place in line of God. And that's what I maintain today. I'm here tonight to maintain what I have found here many years ago. I am a very lucky human being. So many wandered off to do something else. I had never been able to figure that out. I have no idea why they do it. I just know what works for me and some others that I know that I have followed. We've been friends for so damn many years, and God damn, I like that. But a hell of a thing for a human being to be able to say, me who ran in the middle of the night, changed my name 25 times at least in just a matter of a few years. Well, I'm here under false pretenses tonight. Hell, my name isn't Sam. My, <laughs> my real name's Bill. <laughs> when I came here, I lied. I wasn't going to tell people the truth. And then after I tried to tell them the truth, I was stuck with Sam. So I thought, well, all right, I'll go with it. So I, Finally, I ended up putting both names on my driver's license and on the check. So simple as that. It doesn't matter. I'm more interested in what I do and what I don't do. And if I'm able to look in the mirror and it's not a bastard staring back at me anymore, and I know what to do about that. I've been lucky enough to be here long enough to know that. And if I don't know it, I go ask somebody. And I have been to some really great meetings lately, and I've been to some really bummer meetings, too. I, I disagree with people that say I've never been to a bad meeting, and I think, Come with me. I, I <laughs> know a couple right up the street here. I come out of there wanting to drink every night. I go there. <laughs> There's something here for everybody. Find your group and fit in. Belong to it. Get a home group. Oh, God, that's been such a lifesaver for me to have a home group, a place to go that I knew was safe for me, was a minimum of judgmental bullshit that goes on at some meetings that I see. I just walk away from people like that. Go ahead. Keep it up. I'm here to enjoy life. And it's, it's out of our book. It says we are not a glum lot. If the newcomer didn't see some of the things, uh, I mean, happiness here, they wouldn't want what we have. I said, right. Because if I hadn't found those lower companion meetings and people that told me the truth and said, okay, you can have some fun out of life. And I'd never really had that until I came here. So, I'm very glad to be here tonight. I'm glad we can communicate, and uh, there are people in this room that I've known like a long time and that I have loved for a long time. Uh, Carol over here, she and her husband, I, I, we live fairly close to each other and went to a lot of meetings together, had some great times, and those are memories that I, I don't dwell in the past. I'm not one of these old fools that sits around, well, hey, it was better in the 60s. Uh, so <laughs> when do we live? We live in the here and now. I don't give a damn if it was better in the 60s. So what? And there's one that lives near me, and he says, oh, the, those dope fiends, they're going to come in here and corrupt us. They're going to take over. And dope fiends can't get across the street without walk, don't walk signs. They're not going to take over anything. <laughs> they haven't got sense enough to, any of them. <laughs> I firmly believe that AA will never be taken over by anybody unless we fool around it on the interior. That's where Bill Wilson said the trouble was. If anything ever happens, it's going to be inside within Alcoholics Anonymous. So I don't feel anybody's ever going to corrupt me unless I allow it. Simple as that. I have beliefs and experiences, and I think all advice is forget it. Experience is the thing that's of supreme importance according to one of our books. And uh, I don't argue with those books so much. I don't always agree with what's in there, but I certainly don't argue with it. I mean, especially if it works for a lot of other people. Let it. Who in the hell am I to throw rocks through their stained glass window or whatever? I, it's none of my damn business what, how other people stay sober if that's the way they do it. And we had a, a Baptist minister come around our group, and, and uh, he wanted to learn how to cuss. And <laughs> so we tried to teach him. And he gets everything all mixed up, and it's all backwards, but it's a lot of fun. And I've known that guy for 14 years, and I, I value the friendship, and yet he believes in a lot of things that I wouldn't even begin to, but then so do I. I believe in things that you wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. Okay, there's room for everybody. It's the same set of 12 steps for each and every one of us here. So come on in 
and use those things. Don't worry about overshooting the field and having your image in a stained glass window in a club someplace. Not too likely to happen. And so I'm glad we could get here tonight and communicate with each other. And I'd like to thank whoever the hell it was that asked me. I promptly <laughs> forgot. Oh, she won't sign my court card now. Uh, <laughs> imagine if I still had a court card after 44 years. I wouldn't be able to lift it. Uh, enjoy yourself here. And when you have bad days, say something about it and do this. And if that doesn't work, go home and moon the neighbors or something. Just... Uh, Get it out of your system. Don't carry it. And above all, never deny it. So, again, thanks for being here tonight. I'm glad we could get together and communicate with each other. It's been a hell of a good time for me, and I hope it has for you. That's it. Or even thought anything about it. The kind of bars I drank in, I don't think he even noticed. I didn't mention marijuana, they didn't. I didn't mention drugs, they didn't mention it. I thought, okay, I have a slight problem with the bottle, and that's all I copped to. And I stayed clean and sober for 10 days, and I went to a meeting every night. And since I hadn't heard about certain things, I smoked a joint. And then I smoked another one. And then I got thirsty, and I drank. <laughs> then I got drowsy, so I took some amphetamines come out of that. See, I used to bullshit myself that the amphetamines enhanced my intelligence. Yeah, and all they did was speed up my mouth. So I had a combination of an amphetamine mouth, a Demerol brain, and got me into a lot of trouble. So uh, that slip lasted um, about a week. And I had heard about lower companions, and I thought, by God, that's what I am. I haven't gone to a lower companion meeting, and I'm going to quit again and go back and find Alcoholics Anonymous and lower companion meetings. And by golly, that's what I did. And I uh, walked into a club where I'd gone to meetings, and I said, where the hell's a lower companion meeting? He said, right over here at the corner of Pico and Alvarado in Los Angeles. And the group's name was the end of the line. And that sucker was the end of the line. Man, something else. But, started the meeting and the guy pounds the gavel down and uh, he said we don't read here he said there's no traditions here it's every man for himself and I thought, well pretty liberal group a few minutes uh, into the meeting uh, through the side door came three dykes that's yeah, three lesbians uh, well sometimes you have to translate in indiana <laughs> Anyways, as they came through the door, the two uh, sober ones are holding up the drunken one, and she kind of fell, and she dropped her purse, and out fell a gun, a bottle, and a dildo. And the two sober ones got to fighting over the contents of the purse, and the, the chairman kicked them out. They let her stay, and they never came back for her, so we had to take her home, but she sobered up, and she said that she was sober because she was made welcome at that group. Yeah, and I firmly believe that should say it for Alcoholics Anonymous, for anybody that comes in here. I don't care how different you are, or if you're schizophrenic, bring yourselves in. You know, the whole works is welcome. <laughs> Another life-saving thing that happened at that meeting was they asked for announcements, and a guy stood up and he said, I'm sinking into a depression. I'm going to kill myself this week. <laughs> they even noticed. I didn't mention marijuana, they didn't. I didn't mention drugs, they didn't mention it. I thought, okay, I have a slight problem with the bottle, and that's all I copped to. And I stayed clean and sober for 10 days, and I went to a meeting every night. And since I hadn't heard about certain things, I smoked a joint. And then I smoked another one. And then I got thirsty, and I drank. <laughs> then I got drowsy, so I took some amphetamines. <laughs> Come out of that. See, I used to bullshit myself that the amphetamines enhanced my intelligence. 
Yeah, and all they did was speed up my mouth. So I had a combination of an amphetamine mouth, a Demerol brain, and got me into a lot of trouble. So uh, that slip lasted um, about a week. And I had heard about lower companions, and I thought, by God, that's what I am. I haven't gone to a lower companion meeting, and I'm going to quit again and go back and find Alcoholics Anonymous and lower companion meetings. And by golly, that's what I did. And I uh, walked into a club where I'd gone to meetings, and I said, where the hell's a lower companion meeting? He said, right over here at the corner of Pico and Alvarado in Los Angeles. And the group's name was the end of the line. And that sucker was the end of the line. Man, something else. Started the meeting, and the guy pounds the gavel down, and uh, he said, "We don't read here." He said, "There's no traditions here. It's every man for himself." And I thought, "Well, pretty liberal group." A few minutes into the meeting, uh, through the side door came three dykes, that's three lesbians. Uh, well, sometimes you have to translate in Indiana. <laughs> Anyways, as they came through the door, the two uh, sober ones are holding up the drunken one, and she kind of fell, and she dropped her purse, and out fell a gun, a bottle, and a dildo. And the two sober ones got to fighting over the contents of the purse, and the, the chairman kicked them out. They let her stay, and they never came back for her, so we had to take her home, but she sobered up, and she said that she was sober because she was made welcome at that group. Yeah, and I firmly believe that should say it for Alcoholics Anonymous, for anybody that comes in here. I don't care how different you are or if you're schizophrenic, bring yourselves in. You know, the whole work is welcome. Another life-saving thing that happened at that meeting was they asked for announcements, and a guy stood up and he said, I'm sinking into a depression. I'm going to kill myself this week, and I want to say goodbye to all my friends. And if I don't know it, I go ask somebody. Well, I have been to some really great meetings lately, and I've been to some really bummer meetings, too. I, I disagree with people that say I've never been to a bad meeting, and I think, come with me. I, I <laughs> know a couple right up the street here. I come out of there wanting to drink every night. I go there. <laughs> There's something here for everybody. Find your group and fit in. Belong to it. Get a home group. God, that's been such a lifesaver for me to have a home group, a place to go that I knew was safe for me, was a minimum of judgmental bullshit that goes on at some meetings that I see. I just walk away from people like that. Go ahead, keep it up. I'm here to enjoy life. And it's, it's out of our book. It says we are not a glum lot. If the newcomer didn't see some of the things, uh, I mean, happiness here, they wouldn't want what we have. Uh, right. Because if I hadn't found those lower companion meetings and people that told me the truth and said, okay, you can have some fun out of life, and I'd never really had that until I came here. So I'm very glad to be here tonight. I'm glad we can communicate, and uh, there are people in this room that I've known like a long time and that I have loved a long time. Uh, Carol over here, she and her husband, I, uh, we lived fairly close to each other and went to a lot of meetings together, had some great times, and those are memories that I... I don't dwell in the past. I'm not one of these old fools that sits around, well, hey, it was better in the 60s. Uh, so, <laughs> when do we live? We live in the here and now. I don't give a damn if it was better in the 60s. So what? And there's one that lives near me, and he says, oh, the, those dope fiends, they're going to come in here and corrupt us. They're going to take over. And dope fiends can't get across the street without walk, don't walk signs. They're not going to take over anything. <laughs> they haven't got sense enough to, any of them. I firmly believe that AA will never be taken over by anybody unless we fool around it on the interior. That's where Bill Wilson said the trouble was. If anything ever happens, it's going to be inside within Alcoholics Anonymous. So I don't feel anybody's ever going to corrupt me unless I allow it. Simple as that. I have beliefs and experiences, and I think all advice is forget it. Experience is the thing that's of supreme importance, according to one of our books. 
And uh, I don't argue with those books so much. I don't always agree with what's in there, but I certainly don't argue with it. I mean, especially if it works for a lot of other people. Let it. Who in the hell am I to throw rocks through their stained glass window or whatever? I, it's none of my damn business what, how other people stay sober if that's the way they do it. And we had a, a Baptist minister come around our group, and, and uh, he wanted to learn how to cuss. And <laughs> reeled in my umbilical cord. Mama had been to Al-Anon. Yep. She had those little beady eyes and that smile. She got me up against the wall and released me. <laughs> Said, you can stay here for a couple of days and you get your ass out of here because you're going to stay loaded. And I thought, what? Who, me? Mr. Nice Guy? While I was there, the, my youngest brother came around running from the police and other people. And one morning as he and I were puking together, he says to me, if our luck holds out, we'll be dead by noon. <laughs> How bad it was. Then we got a little booze to stay down, and pretty soon he's saying, as soon as we get off of this one, let's really go on one. And that's all it ever took for me was to get some of that stuff to stay down, and then by God, I was out and running again. And a few days later, he and I came to in the back seat of a wrecked car in a junkyard full of wrecked cars, and if you're paranoid, that'll do something to you. <laughs> it's early in the morning, there's fog all over the place, and he's waking me up, and he said, wake up, I think we've been thrown away. <laughs> and, it was more than I could handle, I got out of there, I could hear it. I moved to Venice, California, where I was to live for the next 32 years of my life. I knew enough to start at the bottom because that's where I usually was anyway. So I walked into a bar in Venice and said, where's the worst place in town to live in? The guy said, right over there. He said, I don't even go in that place in the daytime. I went, okay. So I moved in. I fell in love with the girl next door. She was a schizophrenic, suicidal, manic, depressive, <laughs> hated life as much as I did. She would come home every night from work and she'd brush her teeth, turn on the gas, and go to bed. <laughs> and now, so it was natural for us to fall in love. She kept telling me how she was schizophrenic, and I said, don't worry about it, I'll have sex with both of you. <laughs> so, <laughs> I lived there for two years, and after the end of the second year, I called my father at Christmas time, which was the only time he would accept a collect con and I'm, by this time, two days off of everything. It's the first time in my life since I'd started using that I'd ever been off of anything, and it, it frightened me. I didn't know what the hell to do. I'm wandering around town trying to find a meeting, just crazy and alone. I finally found a meeting that night. In those days in Los Angeles, most meetings ran from 8.30 to 10 o'clock. I walked into the meeting at 10 minutes of 10. There was a woman sharing, and she said that she wet her pants twice and came to AA. I thought, well, wait till they find out what I've done. I never even thought anything about it. The kind of bars I drank in, <laughs> they even noticed. I didn't mention marijuana. They didn't. I didn't mention drugs. They didn't mention it. I thought, okay, I have a slight problem with the bottle. That's all I copped to. And I stayed clean and sober for 10 days, and I went to a meeting every night. And since I hadn't heard about certain things, I smoked a joint. And then I smoked another one. And then I got thirsty and I drank. <laughs> then I got drowsy, so I took some amphetamines. <laughs> Come out of that. See, I used to bullshit myself that the amphetamines enhanced my intelligence. Yeah, and all they did was speed up my mouth. <laughs> so I had a combination of an amphetamine mouth, a Demerol brain, and got me into a lot of trouble. So, uh, that slip lasted um, about a week, 
And I had heard about lower companions, and I thought, by God, that's what I am. I haven't gone to a lower companion meeting, and I'm going to quit again and go back and find Alcoholics Anonymous and lower companion meetings. And by golly, that's what I did. And I uh, walked into a club where I'd gone to meetings, and I said, where the hell's a lower companion meeting? He said, right over here at the corner of Pico and Alvarado in Los Angeles. And the group's name was The End of the Line. And that sucker was The End of the Line. Man, something else. I started the meeting, and the guy pounds the gavel down, and uh, he said, we don't read here. He said, there's no traditions here. It's every man for himself. And I thought, well, pretty liberal group. A few minutes into the meeting, uh, through the side door came three dykes. That's three lesbians. Uh, well, sometimes you have to translate in Indiana. <laughs> Anyways, as they came through the door, the two uh, sober ones are holding up the drunken one, and uh, she kind of fell, and she dropped her purse, and out fell a gun, a bottle, and a dildo. And <laughs> the two sober ones got to fighting over the contents of the purse, and the, the chairman kicked them out. They let her stay, and they never came back for her, so we had to take her home, but... You haven't been sober enough for that. I said, well, what about some of the others? And he said, well, the other one is let go and be dragged, or be dragged. I thought, well, I better let go here. Sometimes after I'd been sober a while, I'd argue with him, and I'd say, you old wet-brained bastard, just shut up and let me alone. And he would say to me, did you hear that noise? I'd say, what noise? He'd say, I heard your mind close. <laughs> So I went to the Venice meeting every Monday night, and I went to the end of the line meeting every Sunday night, and I went to a lot of other meetings. And I began to work the steps because I was afraid not to. And I worked them again that first year because by that time, I wanted to. And it was only possible because I stayed sober long enough to find a want here. And that's why I continue to be an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous now. Uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, I'll be sober 44 years. Well, that's a long time. Uh, that's a long time in the life of any human being, but a long time. It can be an eternity for an alcoholic if you don't find something here. So, and if you don't find it, don't think there's something wrong with your program. See, I, I went through a period of time where I thought I had a spiritual awakening and a spiritual experience, and I really began to carry the message to people that didn't want it. Never left home without the big book. <laughs> and after a while, it really got bad. I began to carry a Bible under one arm and a big book under the other arm. And that'll empty the hall. And did. My sponsor and a guy that ran a, an AA club in Los Angeles decided to do something with me. And so they used to send me out on fake 12-step calls to get rid of me. <laughs> and being an AA fanatic, I brought people back. They hadn't called, but if Alkies are reluctant, offer them a bottle. That's what I did. I bribed them, got them to meetings, and some of those people sobered up, and they're still sober today, and they don't know they're in AA by mistake. <laughs> you can't tell somebody with that much sobriety to get the hell out. Here's your misery back. Uh, <laughs> never made the call. It also proves to me that it's not the individual. It's the group that does it. See, something happens here. Because if any group had a, or I mean, if any single individual had a hold of it, I mean, there's enough of those around anyway. Some cults in California are incredible, man. They're huge. They, uh, man, it's the whole group walks on the water, I think. Uh, well, I'm with old Doc Smith, one of the co-founders, and he said we hold to no glorification of the individual. And I was so spiritual at one time, I could knock an al -Anon down at 20 feet. <laughs> that, uh, I come here on a regular basis because I don't want my spiritual rebirth to become a miscarriage. So, life can be a hell of a thing if you experience it, and by golly, I'm not one of those dudes with binoculars watching everybody else do the things that I've always wanted to do. I get out and do them. I experience life, and some days I don't like it, 
but other days, man, what a blast it is. Especially, uh, lately, there's been two or three newcomers around my neck of the woods that have just literally saved my life. And they, they don't know that, and they don't even need to know it until years later when they can handle it. But <laughs> some of the things they say, I just watch them, and my God, what an experience that is. Our book says this is an experience you must not miss. And, and hell, I don't want to miss it. I want to be right in the big middle of it. Because that's, uh, see, I'm enabled to do that because I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and then I'm enabled to be a human being after that. And uh, I have a hell, of, uh, well, I've got two really good jobs, and, and I love to go to those things, and I enjoy myself, and I just don't take my job serious at all. I'm, I'm a, a disc jockey, I'm on the air a lot, and uh, I cussed on the air the other day, and I thought, well, I don't give a damn, <laughs> so no big deal. Uh, I just refuse to get caught up in that crap that I used to. I can't live on eggshells because that's what I had to do when I was a child. I couldn't stand being around my father. We never knew what he was going to do. And my father was put in the penitentiary once for child beating, let alone the rest of the crap that he did. And it, I'm, uh, you know, the end result of uh, being beaten a lot, emotionally and physically, when I was a child. And you're scarred immediately with that. And it's a hell of a thing to come out of it. But by God, you can. I'd rather at least make the effort than not make the effort and just give up. Oh, 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 oh. Well, and I told so many half-truths about all that crap anyway. And not, it didn't matter if I was the worst that ever was, because I've had a couple of psychiatrists tell me that, and I loved it. And then I met an honest one, a woman, and she said, uh, the others had told me how strong I was, and I loved that. I, man, I posed. The lady told me, you're not strong, you're stubborn. Oh, the truth, again. Thought she was related to my sponsor for a while. who used to <laughs> cut through all that crap that I used to spread. Those of us that are in this room are the luckiest people in the world or in any room of Alcoholics Anonymous and or Narcotics Anonymous or wherever you have to go or want to go. And I'm a firm believer, if you need it, then go over there. Whatever will get you through the night if it isn't mind-bending. And that's what I go by today. I surrender to this power, whatever the hell it is. I believe in the power that created the universe, and that's about it. I don't make a big deal out of it. I, my sponsor already told me, if you get any closer to him, you're going to rip him off. So cut that out. I am nosy on my deathbed. So I answered the phone, and it was a newcomer in a depression. So <laughs> what am I going to tell him? <laughs> <laughs> you interrupted my half-assed suicide attempt. <laughs> no, I didn't tell him that. <laughs> Naturally, I had to tell him how good I felt. <laughs> that was the last time I lied about that. And I don't ever want to put myself in that position again. And I'm the one that did it. It wasn't anybody else. I take the responsibility for my own actions. I don't like to do that on some days, but I don't know of any other way to go that works worth a damn. Now, one of the ways I survived my childhood was detachment. I watched my relatives, and I was not a part of them, nor did I ever care to be, because they have no, they don't know I exist. I go to the family reunions, and it's still the same thing. Now, I'm 73 years old, and my Uncle Frank still asks me when I got out of the Army. I have never been in the Army, for one thing. <laughs> then he'll say, how long have you been wearing glasses? Since I was nine years old, Uncle Frank. I really don't need to be around people like that. Around here, you know, somebody says, how are you? I say, <laughs> oh. <laughs> they understand feel the same way. Now, there's been some unsolvable questions in my life, and I don't fight them anymore. I've uh, surrendered to all this. I once heard a guy say, it's been a rough day because I'm between surrender. Yeah. <laughs> I identify with that because I am one stubborn individual. I will hold on forever right to my deathbed. I certainly discovered that I can do that. 
And so today I surrender on a regular basis. I have people in my life that I can talk to. I take inventories and I still read them to somebody else. And I try to find somebody that's fairly new. I, by that I mean five to ten years, has worked the steps, understands or has somewhat of an understanding of the program, and that uh, certainly has enough. Uh, they will listen to me, in other words. And they've saved my life many times. And that's who I go to to listen to. I, I listen to everybody. You never. So I had found a home, and I'd also found a sponsor. There was a guy there that I used to drink with, and I thought, hey, all right, somebody that knows me. So, but he had a program that was a little too liberal for me. A couple of weeks into my sobriety, George and I were on our way to the end of the line meeting. We stopped to get something to eat, and George ordered a ham sandwich and a bottle of beer. And I said, George, I think beer is a no-no. And... He said to me, beer is a beverage, punk. <laughs> okay. So I took my sandwich and left, and within a matter of months, George had yet another drunk driving charge to add to his list. He ended up being shot and killed by a bus driver in Santa Monica, California. And bus drivers usually just call the cops or kick your ass off the bus. This one shot George through the heart. And so much for beer is a beverage, punk. I had met a man at, at the same meeting, and I liked what he said one evening. He said, I'm sober today, and I'm not unhappy about it. And that was the problem. I knew I didn't like sobriety particularly, and if I'm going to have to go through this the rest of my life, this guy said he wasn't unhappy about it. So I followed him around, and I asked him to be my sponsor. What I didn't know was that he had bullshit filters in his ears. so he could translate all the wonderful things that I had to say. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> and he saved my life, consequently, <laughs> by telling me the truth. And I'd ask him about this, the things we had up on the wall, about live and let live and all that sort of thing. And he'd say, well, in your case, live and let live means mind your own goddamn business. I thought, well, I can understand that. I said, what about think, think, think? He said, in your case, it's with what, 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 so forget it. <laughs> You haven't been sober enough for that. I said, well, what about some of the others? And he said, well, the other one is let go and be dragged, or be dragged. I thought, well, I better let go here. Sometimes after I'd been sober a while, I'd argue with him, and I'd say, you old wet-brained bastard, just shut up and let me alone. And he would say to me, did you hear that noise? I'd say, what noise? He'd say, I heard your mind close. <laughs> So I went to the Venice meeting every Monday night, and I went to the end of the line meeting every Sunday night, and I went to a lot of other meetings. And I began to work the steps because I was afraid not to. And I worked them again that first year because by that time I wanted to. And it was only possible because I stayed sober long enough to find a want here. And that's why I continued to be an active member of alcohol.